All right, good morning. You ready to dig into the Word this morning? All right, we'll be in Luke chapter 2 this morning, so you make your way to Luke chapter 2, New Testament Gospel. And we've been in this series called The Characters of Christmas. We've been kind of looking at some of the different characters in the Christmas story. We started our week one with Zechariah and Elizabeth and what God did there by bringing John the Baptist. And last week we looked kind of at Mary and Joseph, what Mary was going through. And this week we're going to kind of look at the story of the shepherds. The shepherds are an integral part of the Christmas story. So um, we're in week three of Advent, and this week is joy. We're, we're talking about joy this morning. And, and, you know, joy is, sometimes we confuse joy and happiness. So you think happiness and joy go together. But actually, happiness is an emotion. And emotions, as you know, they can change. You know, one minute you can be happy, and the next minute, you know, let's say Marshall scores a touchdown, and the next minute... Deb's happy, and then the next minute they don't, and she's probably like, uh, you know. And so, but joy is actually an attitude. It's actually an attitude, and joy is something that you can actually choose. It's also a gift from God. In the Bible, in Ephesians, says it's a fruit of the Spirit. So joy is something that God wants to give to you, and that comes from what we're going to read about this morning, um, Christ our Lord. So joy being an attitude, joy is actually something you could grow. It's something you can grow. It's, it's something you can practice. And um, I remember when I was younger, like, I was not the most joyful person. <laughs> I don't know if any teenager ever really is joyful, but when I was younger and I was a teenager, especially when we first got married, joy was just not something I didn't even comprehend it. You know, I was like, it just wasn't my thing. But I remember when we got kids and those first couple of Christmases having kids, there's something joyful that happens around having little ones and, and, and buying gifts and things like that. And as we were married and we started kind of building our own Christmas traditions and coming up with our own stuff, you know, it, it'd be joy came in. But I remember one time hearing a message at Christmas saying, okay, God, I don't feel so joyful. Why is that? You know, and I, I'm singing a song, you know, joy to the world and all that in church. And I'm like, I, don't, I just don't feel that joyful. And, and that's when I realized it's because I wasn't choosing joy. And around the holidays, and you got to choose it. It's an attitude. It's something that God wants to do in you. So you got to not only choose it, but you got to do joyful things. So that's what I think is the fun about Christmas time is, is there are so many joyful things you could do to uplift your spirit. You could go see the lights. If you haven't been in Ashland yet, you can go over to the park and, and walk and check out all the lights. They're pretty amazing. Um, last night, my wife did something joyful. She hauled me off to her company Christmas party and you know, and I got to meet all kinds of doctors and people that are just very educated, and, and listening to them talk shop as they're sitting around their Christmas party, and the food was good, though. <laughs> but it was cool meeting new people, but um, this year, it was really funny. This, one of the things that's bringing me joy this year is not only my relationship with Jesus, because you got to be, when you spend time with Jesus and you spend time with the Word, you naturally get some joy out of that because I'm reminded of why Christ came at Christmas and he came for our salvation. So there's just a simple fact that I'm saved and you're saved and you're saved this morning. That's something that gave us joy. But there's also things you can find joy in your family and so on. And, and so we're Christmas shopping for the grands and our grandkids are in there. Anybody know what Bluey is? Bluey, parents out there, Bluey? So I didn't know what Bluey was. I'm like, okay, Bluey, Blue's Clues. I start, you know, whatever. And so we're walking around and and Isabel's very much into Bluey. And I'm like, okay, Rami got a lot of joy this Christmas because Grandpa, or Papa as they've been calling me, I had to Google Bluey. <laughs> yep, I had to Google. Well, I don't got little ones in the house. I don't watch that stuff, right? So I had to Google Bluey. I had to figure out what Bluey was. I guess it was a healing hound or something like that. Healer dog or something like that, but whatever. It's a cartoon. And so I had to Google what it's about so that I know what to shop for. So then I walk around Walmart, and lo and behold, Walmart's got a Bluey section because Bluey's pretty popular. So I was just getting a kick out of like, have I really gotten that old that I don't know? <laughs> that I don't know? Like, I've, I've not played with toys in so long. Maybe it's a good thing, but it was kind of fun walking around and like Googling, you know, what are two year olds into because there's all kinds of stuff you could buy, but you know how it is. You want to buy them something that they enjoy. So. Rami just had a huge blast walking around Walmart picking on me yesterday. <laughs> so there's things you could do like that, like shopping, go see some gifts. Like, have you done something joyful so far this Christmas? Have you? And what brings you joy this morning? 
Like I said, joy is an attitude, so something you choose, so something you got to grow. Listen to Christmas music, worship, and so on. And so Luke chapter 2, God is about to make a really big joyful announcement. So Luke chapter 2, verses 8 through 20, says this, In the same region there were shepherds out in the field keeping watch over their flocks by night. And the angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring to you good news of great joy that will be for all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God, saying, Glory to God in the highest, and earth peace among those whom he is pleased when the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste, and they found Mary and Joseph with the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told to them concerning the child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen, it has been, as it has been told to them. What a scene, right? What a scene. Now, I want you this morning, as adults, to put your imagination hat on. Sometimes you got to just think. You got you to allow yourself to, to dream a little bit. I, wa- I want you to think this morning, as I talk through what was happening here, just, just kind of put yourself in a story for a minute. What would it have been like to be those shepherds out in their field and all of this just blows up and happens right in front of them? Um, I think when you do that, sometimes I think as adults, I mean, if you've been in church long enough, I know I'm not the first person to preach this chapter of Scripture to you. It's not even the first time I've done it since I've been here at New Beginnings. So you've probably heard it. And sometimes, sometimes we hear the Christmas story scriptures and we're like, okay, you know, and you're already checking out, checking Facebook back there, you know, whatever you're doing. And so, but I want you not to this one. I want you to just to kind of dig in, and I want you to just use your imagination a little bit, and I want you to put yourself in the shepherd's story and think about what would happen if, if this is what God did for me, God made me see. And so my bottom line this morning is joy is an attitude we grow while in relationship with Jesus. That's what joy is found. So Luke 2, 8 through 14 we get this wonderful picture. And, the, and God, as I said the last couple of weeks, it has been 400 years since there had been a prophet. Nobody has heard from God until Zechariah and Elizabeth. And God was getting ready to do the very thing he promised all the way back in the very beginning in Genesis chapter 3 in the garden. God was getting ready to send his son into the world so that we could be saved. God was getting ready to do the most incredible thing. And, and you would think that if, if God was going to make such a, a grand announcement, I know if you were to make such a grand announcement this morning, would you go out in the field and find a couple of migrant workers or somebody nobody knows and tell them the great news? No, I mean, you, you would go find the news, the media, social media. You, you'd find somebody who knows somebody who knows somebody who could then do what, right? You, you wouldn't just pick the guys that are out in the field to give them the grandest announcement of all time. You know, you, you'd, you'd be in the cities. You'd want the religious leader. You, you'd want somebody. And, and here God just chooses these shepherds to do this. And it's, it's absolutely amazing. So he goes and says, you know, there's good news. You know, what is the good news? Is, is the good news still good news today? I believe some of the good news is this, that God's anointed one, was not just going to come in as a baby confined in a stable, but God himself, Emmanuel, God with us, was coming into the world, into our situation, into our time, into our places, into our lives, because the good news is this, Jesus saves, amen? The good news is the gospel this morning. It's, it's the fact that God so loved the world that he doesn't want to condemn the world, that God, God knows that we're sinners, and God doesn't want to condemn us in our sin, but he wants to save us. He wants to, he wants to God had this most incredible rescue plan. A rescue plan, like God was about to do something. So you get, you get these shepherds. Now, in their day and age, a shepherd was like, like the, the, you know, everybody would ever watch Mike Rose, Dirty Jobs? Like the shepherds was 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 not was not a not a great job. It was cold. It was wet. You had to mess around with these sheep, and the sheep don't always listen. And sometimes you got to break their leg and carry them over your shoulder because they're so rebellious. And, and it's, they do that. 
Like, I, sometimes I think about that as a pastor. Like, man, if I could just break their leg and hold on to them, they might figure it out. <laughs> you know? <laughs> You know, they had, they, these, these guys were in the, in, the, in the lowest form of society. They were, they were just kind of nobodies. And it, it was the nobodies. It was the ordinary people. It was, it was the you and me's of the world, the people like Mary, wrong side of the trash, so on and so on, that God comes into their world with great news of great joy. The Bible tells us this, man, that the glory of the Lord had shone around them. Now, that's why I want you to use your imagination for a second, because I know that you hear this and you start thinking about all the Hallmark cards, you know, the, the little fluffy clouds and the cute little angels and, 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 and maybe your idea of the glory of the Lord this morning is just kind of cute, it's kind of small and, and you're just like, okay, whatever. But, but the Bible doesn't paint that picture. Like the New Testament speaks of a majestic presence and a manifestation of the glory of God, both in cloud and consuming fire. And the book of Exodus filling the tabernacle and the temple was the fire by night and the cloud by day. And this, it was God's presence was so strong that only certain people could approach it. And the holies of holies of the temple were God's presence, where his glory was shown. If you went in there without the right permission, you were dead. You couldn't do it. In Moses' day on Mount Sinai, God's, God's glory had shown there too as a, as a smoke and a fire that consumed the mountain where Moses was at. And it said the earth shook. We get a picture of God's glory here. I don't know if you've ever seen like a really powerful thunderstorm, but it's even greater than that. Like when we lived in Michigan, you know, when you come uh, from the side of Illinois across Lake Michigan, it's 60 miles. And when those thunderstorms come out of Illinois, they uplift and build. So you're watching them across the water as they're kind of dark and nasty and they're billowing, they're growing, and you see them getting bigger. And like, like you just sit there on the shore of Michigan thinking, we're in trouble. I mean, I've seen some powerful thunderstorms take full-size evergreens out of the ground and turn them upside down and, and do all kinds of stuff. Like, and this is the kind of picture of God's glory that it's just awesome power. It's more powerful than, than we can ever imagine. And even in Ezekiel, in chapter 1, Ezekiel's, Ezekiel's vision of God's glory was God was full of fire, thunder and lightning and tumultuous sounds. It, it looked like fire was in his eyes and a sword came out of his mouth. And it was, it was such a brilliant light that every man and woman in the Bible who has got a glimpse of God's glory, as we read this week in Revelation 1 with John, what did John do? He fell over dead. Right? He fell over. He, he couldn't take it. He, he, just, he just falls out and falls over. And, and God has to, remember Revelation 1, so he, God has to touch him and say, it's okay. Picks him back up, shakes him off, says, I'm doing something here. Like, like you got to understand that for, for the, the manifestation of God's presence was incredible. It was the most powerful thing you could possibly think of and ever see. And yet we in Christ, we're going to see that someday. Amen. Someday you're going to get to that place where you're going to get before God and you're going to see that glory. I know when I read the description in the Bible, I'm like, I want to see that, don't you? I want to see that. So the good news came into a, a broken world. And I guarantee the shepherds are not hitting on the sill side like, oh, that's cute. I mean, the Bible says that they were, they were fearful. Like, like it, was, it was amazing what they were seeing. And the good news came into a broken world where people were held back by religious and political powers and pressure. For the most ordinary people, joy was hard to come by. When you're living in the kind of world where it seems like the whole system and everything is oppressive and against you, and you feel like the world's coming down on you, it's hard to get some joy, isn't it? It's hard to get some joy. If you would have asked those shepherds on the field if they were joyful, they would have said No. Some of us were like that at Christmas right now, right? It's, it's hard to be joyful because there, maybe there's something going on in your life this morning. Tonight at 6, we have our, our grief vigil for those who have lost somebody. And we're going to have candles up here, we're going to have pictures, and we're going to pray for families and people that are hurting through the holidays because joy is hard to come by if you're grieving. So we want to share some hope tonight at 6 p.m., and I hope that you'll come on and join us for that. Even if, you, even if you just want to light a candle, because some of you have lost somebody in the last year or the last two years, or maybe you just want to come tonight just to share the love of Christ with somebody who's hurting. They're going to have some um, candle lighting and some balloons, and then there's food from Holy Smokes or something they're going to have afterwards. 
But we do that because we want to share the love of Christ and share that even though things are hard, there's still a reason to have joy. And that is because God loves us and we love each other. So this announcement was all about God's grace. God was coming into the world with the most unlikely people. And you remember grace. What is grace? Grace is God's unmerited favor. Like, we don't earn it. We don't deserve it. God just gives us it. It's a, it's a gift. And, and that's what God wants to give this morning. Is God, God knows that maybe you're not feeling so joyful this Christmas, but he wants to give you that. It's a gift of the Spirit. Like, but you've got to change what you're focused on. If I'm focused on the things that are wrong in my world, like the shepherds were focused on their job and the sheep and the, the political and the religious pressure and so on, it's hard to be joyful. But if I have something that brings me joy that I can focus on, doesn't that change your whole attitude? Isn't it, isn't it a wonderful thing to have something? So what is it for you that brings you joy this morning? What is it this Christmas that brings you the most happiness? What is it that brings you peace? You know, God's will for this is what's going on here. Is God's glory is on its way. He's going to shepherd. He's bringing good news. And this is because God has always desired to have a relationship with people. God's always desired to have a relationship with people. And, and this is why Christ came into the world, because sin broke that relationship. Sin breaks our relationship with God. It, it sets up a separation between us and God. And the only way to bridge that, the only way to bridge that gap, the only way to, to bring us back in the right relationship with God is that Jesus had to come. Now, many different religions argue about whether Jesus was God or not. The scripture clearly teaches he was. It was God with us. And Jesus chose to come into the world at the right time. And Jesus chose to come in as a humble child and baby to set an example throughout his life and lifetime, but he also chose to go to the cross. And when he chose to go to the cross, he chose to go to the cross for me and you. That's the good news, that Jesus chose you this morning. I gotta get an amen on that. I'm gonna say it again. Jesus chose you this morning. Right? Turn to somebody and smile this morning. Don't say anything, just smile. Look at how you're smiling. All right, now turn to somebody and say, Jesus chose you. Okay, wait, 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 we're going to fix it. Turn to somebody with some conviction this morning and say, Jesus chose you. (coughs) Some of you need to get that yelled into your system, right? Jesus chose you this morning. (coughs) Sorry, I'm still getting over my cold, but he chose you. Jesus chose us at the right time. It has been suggested throughout many different, many different theologians over the years that the shepherds near Bethlehem may have been caring for the sheep that were used for the sin offering in the temple. They were caring for the sheep that were sacrificial, the sheep that would be slain for sin. If this is true, it would be fitting that these shepherds would be the first to visit the Lamb of God. This would mean even more sin. Because the name of Jesus means Savior. Luke is the only gospel writer who specifically calls Jesus Savior, which he does five times just in his first couple chapters. The humble shepherd was the first to hear that salvation was personally available, that salvation was coming into the world, and salvation was for each one of us, which means as much as it was applicable to them them then, it's applicable to us today. Salvation is available, but I want you to know this morning, I just have to say, like, your sin offends God. Your sin offends God. God is not pleased at all with your choice to live in sin or have sins in your life. Even just a little bit of sin is still more than enough to kill you spiritually. Like God is not pleased at sin whatsoever. And God did not choose to leave us in our sin, but he chose to give us a solution. He chose he choose to set us free from that. And, and here's the thing. Sometimes we talk about sin in a way, and we want to talk about the good news this morning, but the good news, if we got to talk about sin together, the good news is that sometimes we're, we, we know that sin is sin, right? Like I look out, the world's a mess, and it's broken, and, and sin is sin, and we get that. And, and so, but sometimes in the church, we've got a bigger problem because God is, God is offended that sin is sin, but he's really offended when Christians sin. He's really offended that when you know better and you still don't do what's right. That 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 offends God. He God's not pleased with that. And and here's the here's the good news is like like even though while we were still sinners, Romans 5 8, Christ died for us, amen. So God wants to set us free. So you got you get a choice this Christmas. 
one day you're going to stand before God and his glory is going to be on display. And in that moment, either he's going to look at you and say, well done, because you've been faithful. You've been working out your salvation. You've been walking in repentance. You've been, you've been walking with Jesus. He's going to look at you and say, well done. Or he's going to look at you and say, we got to talk. And the Bible says we're going to give an account for, for every misspoken word and every misspoken deed. And it's like, it, that's why it is so heartbreaking when we see Christians fall back. When we, when we see Christians fall away. When we see Christians go backwards into their sin as if Christ never died in the first place. And like we, we want to make sure that the good news is the good news always. And I think sometimes, sometimes for us, for joy to return in our lives, sometimes you have to look in the mirror and you got to preach the good news to yourself. Sometimes, I swear, I'm telling you, I've had to, sometimes you need to pick yourself up by your boots and pull up your big girl pants and your big girl you know, boy pants. Also. You need to pick yourself up, dust yourself off, look at yourself in the mirror and say, self, you need to repent. Jesus did not die on the cross for this behavior. You need to stop. You need to preach the gospel and say, I'm not going to take advantage of the grace of God because God wants to pour salvation on me. Why would I want to give that away? So I got to open that up. And here's the deal. When you repent, right? The good news is this. When you repent, the Bible says he's able to forgive and willing to forgive. Like, like God wants to forgive you. I'm so grateful that I'm not God. Because, you know, there's times in my life where somebody wrongs me. Man, forgiveness is hard. Right? It's hard. Somebody does something that I don't like or whatever it is, and, and, I, and, and I just want to pay them back. You know, I'll tell you, I've been married for 30 years now. Married people, you know what I'm talking about. There, there's sometimes it's, it's, you just, you're mad at your spouse for some reason. All right? You walk around, and, and sometimes, if, sometimes if you wrong each other and arguing or hurt each other, sometimes it's even a little bit hard to forgive. And, and even in marriage, you've got to preach the gospel to yourself. Like, I'm so glad that, that God doesn't love us that way because God loves us so perfectly that even though our sin forgives us, his love is greater. And God has something for you. The newborn child is, is Christ the Lord. His human name is to be Jesus, right? But the angels who knew him before he came to earth knew that this was Christ the Lord. And Christ means the anointed one. It was the first announcement that Jesus was the Messiah, the chosen one, the one of God. He was one from the, whom the Jews had longed for, but sadly they missed because John 1.11 says this, he came to his own and his own people did not receive him. Can you imagine Jesus comes down from heaven and, and God is making this, this amazing announcement and, and Jesus is he's in his earthly ministry and he's preaching repentance for the kingdom is coming. He so wants his people to just get it. He, he wants people to walk with him humbly and walk with him faithfully. But the testimony was scripture that even his own people didn't accept his message and rejected him. And sometimes as Christians, we get to the place where we look at that and say, man, that's crazy, right? But you know what? If there's sin in our lives this morning, we're doing the same thing. If there's sin in our lives this morning, if we haven't repented of our sins all the way, and I don't mean some of the way, I don't mean like, you know, not, not feeling guilty on the altar, but, I mean, but repenting of our sins all the way and say, okay, God, I need you to forgive me, God, and I'm, I want all of it. I no longer want to do this, God. So I, I want your sanctification in my life, God. I, I want you to work in my life. I, I, I want to be holy. Do you want to be holy this Christmas? Is, is that the choice you made that before God, you have decided to open up the Christmas gift and say, okay, if Jesus could live a perfectly sinless, spotless life, fully devoted to God, doing no wrong whatsoever, setting an example for us, I want to be like Jesus, amen? Like I want to. That doesn't mean I'm always like Jesus because Jesus is a really great Jesus and sometimes I'm not a great Jesus. But it doesn't mean I, don't, I, don't, doesn't mean I stop trying. The thing I had to learn in my life that the good news had to be the good news all the time, which means there is times in my walk with Jesus where, where I was opening up the gift of the good news, but then I would do something dumb and I'd walk backwards. And it seems like this thing is like when you walk backwards, for some reason you want to quit. 
When, when, when some sin comes into your life, you want to quit. You, 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 you want to hide. You want to act like God can't see you. And like, like, you know, it's just so silly. Like when my grandkids are here, they're playing hide and seek under the dining room table. And, and as he swears that you can't see her, man, she'll cover up in a blanket and she'll be like, and like, like we can still so we know you're there. <laughs> like, I know you're there. <laughs> and it was a game to go over there and yank the blanket off her and she goes, ah. You know, they put it back on her, and she's acting like she's hiding. Like, we do that with God, don't we? Like, and, and God's like, eh, just stop. Just stop. Stop walking backwards. Like, like it, it, some of us this morning, we've been in the church for so long that we've forgotten what the gospel is. And we've forgotten to preach the gospel to ourselves. We've forgotten how loving and forgiving God is. We've forgotten that that, that, that glory shown, that announcement to the shepherds in that field, that was for us too. And you know what the best part about it is when you accept the love of God and, and you choose to get right with him over and over and over again, that's where joy comes from. Because it's got to feel good. Like, I, don't, I don't know about you, but when I know God has forgiven me, it feels good. And this is what Jesus came in the world because Jesus came in the world, we talked about peace. Like peace, the word shalom, which is peace in the Hebrew, it means a whole health. It means it's not just like, hey, peace. It's like there's no war today. But peace is a whole a whole body, a whole healing. Like it's a thing that God wants to do from the top of your head to the bottom of your toes. Like, like God wants to, his peace to wash over you. Like his forgiveness is so heavy that it, it washes over you. Like anybody got a weighted blanket? I don't know if there's still a thing, but a couple years ago, Rami wanted a weighted blanket for Christmas. And she, what, 40 pounds or whatever it is? That thing is so heavy. <laughs> Literally, she got, the first time she opened up the box, she got on the couch and covered her up with it. Guess who didn't move for the rest of the day? <laughs> Say, it's like 40 pounds. And like, that's how sin feels, isn't it? Like when you have sin in your life and, you, and you're not preaching the gospel to yourself, you're not preaching the good news, you know, the good news, that's how sin feels. It weighs you down. But the love of God reaches and pulls it off. And he frees you. Peace is a whole life peace. And, and what did the shepherds do? Because they get this good news. Like, man, they, they've been waiting thousands of years for the Savior to come. And, and God goes to these lowly shepherds in the field. So guess what? Salvation's coming. Like, like, you're still wanted. God still loves you. Even though you're a shepherd, you're somebody. Turn to somebody in the church this morning and tell them, you're somebody. You're somebody. So they get the good news, right? and the good news is the gospel. And so Luke 2, 15 and 17 says this, when the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to each other, let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste. Anybody know what the word haste means? They weren't doing this. They got the run on. They were going for it. And they said, and they went and they found the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning the child. It might be hard for us in 2023 to imagine this experience and what it must have been like. How incredible the announcement was that the shepherds react and they make haste. The shepherds get the good news. They get the gospel. And what do they do? They drop everything in the field. It's, you know what the most valuable thing in their life was? Their sheep. And it does not tell us that they went and brought the herds with them. They did the same thing the disciples did, man. They, they left it. They said, oh, even the most value, most, most our job, our, our reputation, our identity, everything got left on that hillside that night where they made haste to go and find Jesus. They made haste to go and find Jesus. And then they get in there, and if you imagine them, they're like, okay, you know, if not, the story isn't incredible enough. But then they get in that little manger, and the manger would have been is that in those day and age, they had houses. And the top floor of the house was where you lived, and the bottom floor was like a little barn where you kept your animals. So they arrive at one of these places, and what do they do? The exact thing the angels told them, there's this baby laying in a manger. I don't know if they asked themselves and said, that's the Savior. That cute little baby is the Savior. Like you have to believe in the word of God to believe in the whole entire story. 
So they see the baby there, and they, and they look at Mary, and they say, you know, Mary, i got to tell you something. Like, we were minding our business. We were sitting on a hillside, and, and all of a sudden, man, the heaven just opened up. Thunder, lightning, the glory of God, and angels praising him. And, and like, like can you imagine being Jesus' mom at that moment? Look at these shepherds, like, what are you smoking? <laughs> what have you been doing? And they share the news with her and tell her, and this has got to, you got to, sometimes I think you got to use your imagination. Imagine what God was doing here. Not only did they went and found, but they became the first evangelists to share the gospel because they take the message of the gospel back home and tell Mary and Joseph, here's what's going on. It reminds us today that, you know what? Sometimes we just got to go and find Jesus. And I'm not talking about finding Jesus the first time. I'm talking about there's many days where you need to just drop everything you need to drop this morning your identity. If your identity isn't in Christ, you need to drop that. Your job, your profession, whatever it is that's getting in the way of you truly having Jesus, that needs to be left in a field this morning or left in a pew where you're sitting. And sometimes we got to just go after Jesus. We, sometimes we got to pick ourselves up, share the gospel with ourselves, the good news, and then we got to go and find him. Where do we find him? Where do we find him? In our prayer time? When we get alone with the word? When we worship? When we look in the mirror and share the gospel with ourselves? Like, I don't know about you, but it seems like the years are going by faster and faster. It seems like we're always doing something. And you know what? I know for some of you that it's already two weeks to Christmas. And have you went, I'm asking you, have you went and found Jesus yet? Have you went and spent time with him? What's your alone time and your quiet time like? Are you making haste in your life to drop everything? What if the thing we have to drop this morning is just the excuses? The shepherds can be like, you know, I like to go see that baby, but I got to care for the sheep. Oh, uh, you know, I got. I would like to go see the baby, but I got a staff here. I got some sheep, you know. I, I would like to have a relationship with Jesus, but I got this, this, and this. Oh, I would like to have a closer walk with God, but you know, I got this thing, and you know, whatever it is. Like, like, have you made that decision in your life this morning to say, Jesus is so worth it that you're going to drop everything for him? Drop everything for him. That's the joy comes from. That's the joy comes from. It is so freeing when you have that moment where you just say, you know what? I want to go and see. I want to get along with him because I need him. Like, I can't live, and, and life makes no sense without him, and, and mostly because so many of us are wearing this weighted blanket of, of sin and burden and, and backsliding and, and, and the world and pressures and family and life and, and gifts and Christmas and society, and you just, you just got this thing on you. you just, it's so heavy. You know what we got to do? We got to take it off. Drop it. Go find Jesus. Some of you this morning, you need to find Jesus for the first time. I'll tell you the most joyful thing I've seen lately is, is last month a guy named Chris recommitted his life here in church. And I don't know if you've been paying attention online, but he's coming back for Christmas Eve to get baptized. Every single week he is just fired up on social media. He's got this joy in the Lord. And I'm going to tell you, when you're going to hear his testimony, he does not have an easy life. He's got a lot of things coming against him that, that actually push back on his salvation, back on his salvation. He's been sharing on social media a little bit. But you know what? When you find Jesus, it's just this joy comes in. And then when you first find Jesus, you get this. So who, who would say, yeah, okay, pastor, I get that. But now you've been following Jesus for 5, 10, 15, 20 years. What's your level of joy? See, I think what happens is, is we first find Jesus and the joy washes over us, but then we start putting the blanket back on. And because we put the blanket back on, that joy that we had at our salvation, it kind of disappears. It's always hanging out in the background, but it kind of disappears. 
And I want you to hear the words of Jesus this morning because these words are for your heart. Revelation 3.20 says this, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. This is the Lord talking to you. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come to him and eat with him and he with me. Here's the thing this morning. Jesus is standing at the door of your heart. He's, and he's just, he's just knocking. Hey, Corey. 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 Uh, want to spend time with me? Hey, guy. guy. Uh, you want to spend time with me? Tom. Hey, Connie. Uh, you want to spend time with me? Like he, he's there like, like he, he wants this relationship with you that he never stops knocking at the door. And the Lord right now is knocking on your heart saying, man, would you just open up the door and open it up? Not just don't open it, just a crack. You know, don't open it. I, I can't stand. I'm a big guy. I can't stand when the door doesn't open, open up and I got to squeeze through something, you know. <laughs> like I like when the door's open. And, and here's the thing. Like, like. You have to make the decision to open the door all the way. And then guess what? You got to walk through the door. Now, some of us, we walk in there. Hi, Jesus. Right back to where we're at. <coughs> what happens is year after year, you got a relationship with Jesus, but for some reason, there's no transformation, there's no change. Like, you're just the same, same problems, same struggles, same burden, same sins, same nonsense, same excuses. And it's just, it's because you keep walking back out the door. You got to go through that door, and then you got to shut that door. You got to shut that door. You got to lock that door. You got to choose to go into the room where Jesus is at and say, I'm staying. I'm not going backwards. You might even have to pray this morning and say, you know what, Lord? I'm opening the door to my heart and I want you in there all the way. And I say, God, I need you to shut the door so nothing else gets in. Nothing else gets in. I was preparing to preach this message last night. And Rami, <coughs> somehow, someway, when we got home from the party, I promise you she wasn't drinking. But she left the car door open. The car door was open. We, let, we go out the window, and the car door to Jeep was wide open. Like somebody, was, somebody got in there. And I'm like, like what is what? <laughs> now, nothing was missing. Nothing was tampered with. But the minute she yelled through the house, hey, the car door's open. You know, I start thinking, like, what? Just running. Where's my gun? No. <laughs> you know, you start thinking the worst right away. Like, who's trying to break in my car? Well, lo and behold, it's because my wife and daughter were so busy. Yep. <laughs> that they forgot to close the door. If you leave doors open in your life to your past, if you leave doors open to your life to the little demons and little things in your life that want to keep drawing you away from Jesus, they're going to keep coming in. If you leave the doors open to your addiction and your habits and your attitudes and whatever it is that's preventing you from having a real relationship with Jesus, that stuff's going to keep coming in. But Jesus wants you to come in and shut the door. How many of us this morning, I, I know it's you because it's me too, you, 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 gotta, you gotta shut the door. Too many of our, look at this room. Some of our people are walking in the wrong doors. And that's not just our church, it's everywhere. I'm not just picking on new beginnings this morning. There's a lot of people that are walking in the wrong doors. And you know what? One of the doors we're walking through this Christmas is you're like walking through the doors of Pennies and, and, and Macy's and all this kind of stuff. Like, I'm going to buy myself some happiness. Well, yeah, you might buy something to make you happy for five minutes, but it ain't going to last forever. Oh, I'm going to just fill my time. Boy, if I could just do more things, I'd be happier. I'm like, nah, but you spent time with Jesus, you'd be happy. How many of this morning need to walk through that door? There's three kinds of reaction to Jesus this morning. Either way, he's ready for you. Are you ready for him? The first reaction was, was the all in the room. It says this, 18 to 21, and all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. 
But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart for the shepherds returned glorifying and praising God. There was an all. We don't know who the all was, but it wasn't just Mary and Joseph and Jesus and the shepherds. There was somebody else there too. There was people there. If, 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 we, if we look at culture back then and they were really staying at a relative's in a lower level of a place, it makes sense. Everybody's home for Christmas. Everybody's home for the census. There was an all there. There's all there. And what the all do is they hear the story. Can you imagine the all? They're like, what? But that's it. They hear the story, but it doesn't move on them. It doesn't change them. It, it, it doesn't do anything for them. It's just like, oh, I, you know, it's like coming to church and you're hearing this message this morning, and I'm telling you, you need to walk through the door, and you've heard it, and you know you need to, but then you're going to leave here without walking through the door. You're one of the all. The all is still lost, y'all. Come on, give me, I said a y'all this morning. I get some credit for that, right? <laughs> the y'all is still lost, y'all. I mean, it's like, like, <laughs> man, the people wondered, but our wonder has to have, our wonder has to turn into, yes. I can't just wonder about Jesus this morning. I have to say yes to Jesus this morning. I can't just wonder about him. I have to accept that this is true. I have to accept the gospel. I have to, I have to accept that. I mean, God is doing this incredible thing. Like, I have to accept it. I have to, I have to open this gift. I have to walk through this door. Like, I can't just stay somebody who's just wondering because if I wonder, I'm never going to go anywhere. So I want my wonder to turn into conviction and my, my conviction to turn into life changing, man. So are you just wondering this morning, what is your reaction to Jesus? The second one was Mary. Mary. Mary took it to heart. Remember Mary, this young girl. The shepherds come to her and they tell her the story. And I could just imagine her heart overflowing with it because she had her own experience with the angel Gabriel. We talked about this last week. So Mary is beginning to learn some things about Jesus. And, and the shepherds come in and say, your baby is just not an old baby, but it's, it's Christ the Lord. Like, like the shepherds come in and tell this most incredible story that, man, God's glory showed it was incredible. Like, you, you had to been there. And Mary, she just takes it to heart. <coughs> Mary knows that. We know that the Christmas season is hectic and busy. We know sometimes the mystery of Christmas gets lost in the mix of just, just, just everything else going on. But is your heart open like Mary this morning where you're taking time to soak it in? Are you taking time to get alone at the Savior's feet and just soak it in and be like Mary and accept it? Is there room in your heart for Jesus this Christmas? Has he taken a residence? Have you given him permission to take up space in your life so that the truth of Christmas transforms and changes your life? Has Jesus taken over your heart this morning? Have you given it to him? Have you made room for him and opened it up? What's your heart's reaction to Jesus this morning? And here's the shepherds, the last one, the shepherds. It says this, and when the shepherds returned, they were glorifying and praising God for all they heard and seen as they've been told to them. The shepherds get a vision, right? The shepherds go into Bethlehem and they see the baby. They tell Mary and the all and everybody else there what happened. And then what do they do? They get their worship on. Like, if you, here's the thing. If, if Jesus is your Savior this morning, and some of you, Jesus is your Savior, amen? Yeah. Have you gotten your worship on yet at Christmas? What's your praise level like? And through all you going through, are you like, man, I'm just walking around fired up. I'm happy. I'm joyful because, because I know Jesus. Like, like I want to talk about him. Like, like, last night, like, it is always weird to be around people you don't know, Right? So you go, and you, you get invited to a party, and Rami's like, you got to go. And all day I told her, I'm not going. It's, it's uh, doctors, you know, weird people. <laughs> social workers even weirder. <laughs> so I'm like, I'm going to get in a room full of social workers. You know what they're going to do? They're going to diagnose me. <laughs> they're going to pull out their big manual and try and tell me. You know, it's like, so all day I'm like, I'm not going, I'm not going, I'm not going. And then finally it gets to be about that time, and you know, I, I just can't say no to my woman. <laughs> because I don't want to sleep on a couch. <laughs> I go, hey, man, it was so good for people to be like, what do you do? I'm like, I'm a church planner. What's that? <laughs> That's so cool. What is that? Like, they never heard the title before. 
So I start talking about new beginnings and all that God's done here in the last five years and what I believe God's still going to do. And, and you see every one of them light up. And they're like, that's so cool. Like, my church has never done that, or I've never seen that before. Or like, like I'm, I'm sharing the gospel with people I don't even know. You know, and, that, and, that, and that's what brings me joy, because guess what? All of a sudden, an uncomfortable situation becomes kind of like, this is cool. I enjoyed the meal. I was like, because, because you know why? Because I got to talk about Jesus. And you know what? I get to brag on God. And, and that's, that's what we should be doing, Christians. We have two weeks till Christmas. Have you bragged on God and said, come to church with me? I want you to come to New Beginnings Christmas Eve service because I believe God has something for you. Come with me. Do you have some lost person that you're praying for this morning because you just want to share the gospel with them because you're like, come with me. Come with me. I, there's somebody in my life who I want to see just peace wash over them like a river. I want to see them get set free because, because Jesus has something for them. How many do I gave these cards last month have given them all away? Or how many of them are they sitting in the visor of the car and you're like, oh, we should do something with those. Did anybody testify this morning that gave them all away? Any raise a hand this morning? One, one, one. Gotta get. Let's pray. <coughs> Here this morning. If you're about to accept Jesus, maybe it's time. Maybe you're online, maybe you're here. Maybe it's time to say, okay, I need that commitment in my life. As I pray, I just want you to just raise your hand and let me pray for you. Online, let us know in the comments. Um, if you've been following Jesus for a long time this morning, and you just need to let him back in, and you want me to pray for that door to be open in your life, raise your hand and I'm to pray for that. God, I pray this morning, Lord, I pray that we would never get tired of hearing the Christmas story, that, Lord, when we hear about what you did with the angels and the shepherds and all that, Lord, that we, like little kids, would still have a sense of awe and wonder and joy. God, I thank you that you had the most perfect plan ever, that, God, I confess as a sinner, I confess that, I, that before Jesus, I lived a broken, messed up life. I was lost, yet God, I'm so grateful this morning that you loved me so much that you brought me salvation. And I'm praying this morning that maybe there's somebody here who it's time to make that commitment. It's time to make that commitment. It's time to say, okay, I'm in, Lord, I'm in. And Lord, I'm praying not only for the lost people in our church and in our community, Lord, this morning, but I'm also praying for the saints this morning because that's what you did. Jesus, you prayed for each one of us, and you prayed that we would have the kind of relationship with the Father that you had, the kind of relationship that was holy, full of love, and perfect. And Lord, sometimes we forget that, Lord, and sometimes, Lord, we know we should walk in the door, but Lord, some of us, we've been walking in the other doors. So Lord, I'm praying for somebody in the church this morning, a family, somebody, raise your hand if it's you. It's time for you to walk back in the door. And it's time for you to walk in that door, and it's time for you to close that door and stay in the room. Lord, I pray that you would help us to stay in the room with you, that we would choose to be in your presence. Uh, this holiday season where, where it's so crazy busy and there's 101 things that we have to do, Lord, I pray that we would find time to be alone with you, time to share the good news with ourselves, to remind us how loved we are. But Lord, I also pray that we would share the good news with somebody else. Lord, I'm praying that you'll add to our number this Christmas and that each and every person in this room who, who calls themselves a Christian will be about your business of sharing their faith. Because, Lord, if we have no desire to share faith, we're not standing in the right room. And if we have no desire to just want to invite somebody to church, Lord, we're not in the right room with you because somehow we've forgotten what it's all about. So, Lord, help us to get in the right place this morning that this Christmas, the gift that we give, is salvation of somebody who so desperately needs it. Allow us to share our faith. Uh, allow us to tell somebody that they're adopted, they can be adopted and loved and chosen and forgiven. Lord Jesus, thank you for loving us and sending us the most perfect gift. 
your life and your example. Bless us in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.